Oh, hi, I'm a smart investor. I dare say that because I understand the cryptocurrency markets and I am up to date on every new development, fintech and blockchain ecosystem. All because I watch the Inside Blockchain Show on Crypto TV Plus. Every Monday morning, Crypto TV Plus brings you news headlines of top stories, interview with an expert and give you detailed market analysis to enable you make the right business moves. Now you too can become a smart investor if you don't miss it. The Inside Blockchain Show, only on Crypto TV Plus. Are you there? It's your boy. No, sorry. It's your daddy, Mr. Macaroni. Keep watching Crypto TV Plus if you want to be doing well, especially. You get me now? Hi. You're Hi. doing well. Hello and welcome to the program. This is Inside Blockchain, live from Crypto TV Plus. I am Bobby Andiki. Now, if this is your first time on the program, kindly follow us across our social media handles, Facebook and Twitter at Crypto TV Plus, and on Instagram at Official Crypto TV Plus. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel and tap the bell icon to stay updated when next we put out a video. Now, on today's edition of the Inside Blockchain, we'll be taking a closer look at an individual that has done remarkably well in the fintech space, in the technology space, and by extension, in every other professional sphere of existence. Now, in 1992, he co-founded what was to become Saxo Bank, a financial multi-asset trading and investment platform. Now, in 2016, after 20 years as the co-CEO of Saxo Bank, he stepped down to focus on other investments through his private family office, Sear Capital. Now, with combined assets of approximately $1 billion, he invested in the foundational blockchain protocol, Concordium. Now, we'll take a quick break, and when we return, I will introduce this special individual. Stay with us. Hey, guys. Welcome into the Metaverse on Crypto TV+. Plus. In today's video, we're going through a portal into the Sinverse. But first, what is the Sinverse Metaverse? Sinverse is a world of virtual realities. It is a Sin City Metaverse. Now, let's talk about the features of the Sin City Metaverse. Sin City is a multiplayer play-to-earn action thriller game. The gameplay revolves around the fictional story that models the happenings in most of the cities of the world where the inscription reads Survival of the Fittest. Players are to face the city. Hello, my name is Chiki and I'm the boy of the bullet. Keep watching Crypto TV Plus. Don't touch that die. Peace. Thank you for joining us. This is Inside Blockchain, live from Crypto TV Plus. And as I mentioned before we went on a short break, today we'll be taking a closer look at an individual that has done remarkably well in the fintech and technology space. Now, um, Lars Sia Christensen is the chairman of the board of Concordium. Now, just to give uh, the viewers out there a brief explanation of what Concordium represents. Now, Concordium is a privacy-focused, public and permissionless blockchain architecture that is designed to be fast, secure and cost effective. Now, Lars, it is very, very important that we actually discuss some of the milestones that Concordium achieved in 2021. Now, the first one on the list, uh, actually understand that you raised over $40 million through private and strategic sales. You ran four successful test nets. And afterwards, you launched the Concordium Genesis mainnet with over 4,000 accounts per day and 200 nodes. Now, in addition, you had a joint venture with a Fortune 500 company, Geely and you built an NFT marketplace on the Concordium blockchain amongst a whole lot of other milestones. That is commendable. Like without a doubt, you've achieved a lot of milestones. How does that make you feel? Well, I was uh, fortunate enough to, to sort of be aware of the internet relatively early when, when that was like what we are today and even, even earlier than where we are now where people still had lots of doubts about the technology. You know, it's hard to imagine if you weren't there. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of people that didn't believe in the internet. It was going to go away. Nobody was ever going to use it. Too complicated, uh, not scalable, no critical mass. And, and when, when I fell over that and, and, and Saxo Bank fell over that, uh, we, we sort of, we could see that there was something in it. You know, we could see that it could make our our model, which was financial trading via telephone predominantly, 
make that more efficient, right? So, uh, so in that sense, we uh, we built a fintech before anybody had even invented that word, I think, and we launched our first trading platform in. In 1997, when there's probably less than 25 million users on the internet globally, which wow, uh, that's impressive. Is, is difficult to imagine today, yeah. right? But I really, I had lots of conversations with bankers saying, you know, why do you waste your time with this thing? People always want to speak to a dealer, and uh, yeah. this is not going to come off, right? Yeah. So that was interesting. Obviously, I guess we were more right than, than most of those guys at the time, because today, 99.99% of all foreign exchange trade, for example, is done online. Uh, but I actually see a lot of parallels to that early stage of the internet. We, we, we have had the same in this industry. Oh, I don't understand the technology, so uh, maybe it's not important. Uh, it doesn't really have critical mass. There's a lot of technical issues with it. Uh, you can't interact with it easily. So it's a very parallel uh, situation. Oh, and, that's, uh, that's very interesting. The way so we fixed that in the internet was creating these bridges that made it easier yeah. to get into the internet. And, and that's the next step for this industry to make it really easy to use the blockchain. Okay, so Lars, I think at this moment, it's only very important that we actually take a closer look at what the Concordium blockchain stands for. Now, the Concordium blockchain is the first blockchain to provide a layer one identification at the protocol level. Now, how did you achieve this as, you know, we all understand that uh, certain implementations are not really easy to achieve at layer one protocol. So talk to us about that. Well, it is important to understand, as you say, that it is a layer one protocol. It's something that you build your use cases on top of. And uh, th I would say we did a lot of, of, of more complicated things than the ID layer itself, because the ID layer in many ways is more an ideological decision, you know, that I, I had been watching in Saxo Bank the development and regulation there for, for more than 30 years in the traditional finance industry. And I am not 99%, but 100% convinced that you're going to see heavy regulation of this space. And the fundamental thing in regulation is actually being able to identify who you're dealing with. Then comes after that additional KYC and, and various checks. But if you don't know who you're dealing with, uh, much of that becomes irrelevant, you can say. Yeah. So, uh, so what we decided to do is ID is a layer one use case. Now, in most cases, there are other ID solutions, but they're built as layer twos on top of it. But I really see the benefit of, of an entire blockchain where every single element out there has an identification. And if you don't like that, you can use another blockchain. But actually, we found that people uh, don't see it as a hurdle. Uh, in fact, they, they seem to prefer it because they know that if they identify themselves, other people that, uh, that are on the blockchain uh, identify themselves. So we use a network of external third-party ID providers. Uh, these are the people that would normally interact with you, identifying you if you're online with a government institution or something like that. We are not the identity issuer. We don't want to be a single point of failure anywhere in this chain. So you can pick and choose your preferred identity uh, provider. And we don't display your identity either, because that would certainly in Europe be a breach of the GDPR legislation, oh. and also a breach of private, uh, of private uh, privacy of, of your ID. The only thing we do is that under some stringent conditions, we can we can identify you, and more importantly, you can identify yourself, yourself yeah. to somebody else if you choose to do it. So if you want to uh, me to use your use case, you may need to know certain aspects of my identity. Okay. And if you ask me for that, I can choose to give it to you. I can also choose not to give it to you, but then you can choose, well, then I don't want to do the business. Yeah. Uh, but if I do choose to give you, like, I'm over 18, I'm Danish, I uh, live in Switzerland, I'm male, whatever aspect you need to know for whatever reason, mm -hmm. then you know with 100% certainty that it's the truth uh, because of cryptographic uh, and zero knowledge proofs, etc. So I think that's the real use case. Everybody thinks this is about catching bad guys, which ultimately could also be used for under, under a, a lawful procedure, uh, court order, regular, uh, regulatory mandate. But it's really also about people just using the blockchain and have some genuine reasonable need for some from some parts of ID and then you can choose to give it but yeah. the good thing is you know f with certainty that if I do give it to you it's the truth and that's fantastic speaking of catching bad guys you would agree with me that you know lately there's been a lot of bad players you know wrecking havoc in the blockchain space the DeFi space the NFT space so it's only right that people would actually look for something uh, an architecture or a product that gives them that 
hundred percent fail safe, you know, utility. So now how would you say the Concordium blockchain retains its pseudo anonymity and anonymity while meeting regulatory and enterprise compliance requirements for users? I, w I wouldn't call it anonymity, I call it privacy. Uh, and there's a lot of privacy aspects on the blockchain which you actually don't find in, in, in the early generations. For example, you can you can shield certain transactions if you want to keep them private. If you imagine uh, on, on, let's say, Ethereum, you have two potentially anonymous counterparties, but everything they do, everybody can read off the blockchain, right? That's that's pretty much the opposite of what you need in the real world, right? Yeah. In the real world, you need two parties that can identify themselves with 100% with certainty to each other, that can, under certain stringent conditions, be held accountable for wrongdoing. But what they do together, they, they can they can be allowed to hold private between themselves. It's a little bit like you don't want everybody looking into your bank account all the time, right? So so I think we, we're hitting the right level here, privacy, but accountability. And I think it, it, we the space will find that uh, even if they don't want to do it today, this will for sure be regulatory demands because the fundamental thing a regulator has to base all of the subsequent regulation on is the fact that they know who they're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is not a question of if, but when. And we see now that there are certainly in Europe coming up laws about demands for uh, identifying uh, people that are doing transfers. So it's unquestionable that this will happen. And then you can choose to say, okay, I'll build that as a layer two, but then it's kind of siloed to my own user base. And then you can build another layer two silo for another user base, but then you're missing the point of a blockchain, right? The blockchain is that everybody can really can participate. See, yeah. mm -hmm. And that's why we think ID is a layer one use case and not a layer two use case. Okay, that's fantastic. So we still have a lot of other things to talk about, but we'll go on a short commercial. We'll pick it up. Stay with us. Welcome to today's episode on exploring NFT projects. We'll be checking out the Bod Ape Yacht Club. Broadly speaking, there are two types of NFT art. Firstly, you have the one-off visuals that are sold as non-fungible tokens, just like the paintings in real life. Think the Bipo NFTs that were sold at Christie's was high as $69 million. Then secondly, you have NFT collections or projects like the Board API Club we are going to be talking about today. Hello, my name is Chiki and I'm the boy of the bullet. Keep watching Crypto TV Plus. Don't touch that there. Peace. Thank you for staying with us. This is still Inside Blockchain, live from Crypto TV Plus. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be looking at a very uh, important personality who has done remarkably well in the fintech and technology space. Is no other person but Lars Sears Christensen. He is the chairman of the Concordia Blockchain. Once again, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, would you consider yourself to be a privacy purist or would you say that your technical team is or constitutes more of privacy purists? I think it's important to understand that uh, privacy is, uh, is a human right in many ways. Anonymity and the ability to do things without being held accountable is, is not a human right in, in my view. So the balance between being able to identify people under certain conditions and most importantly actually being able to identify yourself when you choose to, uh, I think is, is very important, right? For, yeah. for a functioning society that is important. But your privacy, that you can choose the circumstances unless you don't do something, whether it's a, you break a law and hence you have a court order against you, that would be the rest, same in the rest of, of society, uh, then you have the privacy. And in fact, I think we have too little privacy in this world. We have all, we have all handed over our IDs to Facebook and Google and social media. They're yeah. making tons of money on us mm -hmm. and they control your ID, right? So, so this is very much also about pulling the ID back to the person, right? And even creating an ID. For example, here in, in, in many areas in, in Africa, there, there are significant problems with ID systems, etc., and registration of ownership. And I think blockchain is a brilliant solution for that, you know? So, so it's really about both, first of all, of course, giving people the opportunity to have a provable ID. Okay. And secondly, the right to control it and, and keep it private where, where it's appropriate to keep it private. Okay, that's fantastic. So speaking of ID, um, how do you think, uh, like when, when you look at issues like identity theft, how do you think the Concordium blockchain comes in and, you know, how do you think it can provide a solution to, 
you know, that problem. Well, I think at the end of the day, in order to access the, the system, you, you would have to go through an onboarding process, which is not terribly onerous, but it's what you are what you would be used to if, if, if you need to prove your identity in some other context. Okay. So I think we are very much uh, limiting the, the probability of, of, uh, of identity theft here because you have now your identity is linked to a blockchain. We all know the security of a blockchain and certainly this one is a true blockchain with many nodes with some very sophisticated crypto cryptography. So that secure, the security is extremely high, as high as it gets, right? So I think it's, it is a very important uh, a milestone apart from all the use cases you can think of that, that you, can, you can have a provable ID beyond any discussion. And given that it's registered on a blockchain and in your possession, it'd be very hard for anybody to, to steal it from you, right? Yeah. Uh, can something theoretically do somebody else pretending to be you, etc.? Uh, actually, very hard. But, but for example, as, as late as yesterday, I had to report a, a, a fake profile on, on Instagram where somebody is taking you, my picture, taking some oh, of my posts, wow, and now sitting right. writing to my friends that uh, he has a brilliant business idea for them, right? Yeah. Now, that couldn't happen if, if Instagram had been based on the Concordia blockchain. And it happens all the time in, okay. in, in Facebook, it happens all the time in all these social media because they, they don't have an adequate ID protection or an adequate, uh, adequate ID uh, verification, uh, verification yeah. process. Yes, they have it if you have very many followers. Uh, so you get the little tick and yeah, I have, the blue I have, tick. The, have yeah. that on a couple of mine as well. But it still doesn't prevent that somebody else out there can claim can that, that, account, that, that yeah. he's me. Now, if, if, uh, if you also had as a requirement, you needed to have an absolute proof of your identity in order to do that account, which you could do, for example, based on Concordium, you wouldn't have the problem. And, and it happens to me, I wouldn't say regularly, but several times a year. And I know people that are uh, more involved in, 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 in sort of day-to-day -day work in, in this industry that have the problem that happens 20 times, 30 times a year, right? Yeah. Used for various scams. So why the social media don't fix this when, when the solutions are available, I'm, I'm not going to guess about, but, but it seems like it's a problem that would be very easy to fix. And I think it's a problem that needs to be fixed because one thing is irritating for me, but potentially this individual or whoever it is might be cheating other people out yeah. of their money, right? So I, I think, it's, frankly, it's a disgrace that the, that the big tech platforms are not dealing with this issue. Uh, and and here's a way to to deal with it, right? Oh, that's interesting. So moving on um, now, I, I learned about a, a Revo project, uh, which is actually used to solve the problem of uh, greenwashing and carbon credit with uh, founders like um, with founders like uh, Matthew Nelson and Gerald Akiopong. Uh, so I'd like to know: Are there other known blockchain projects? currently built on Concordia? Yeah, this, this is a project that's building at the moment. I, I think uh, we, we actually have several uh, carbon uh, plays and, and various people building that because there, there's a lot of fraud in that area. People people want to offset their carbons. People tell them they, 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 they plant a tree somewhere, but where's the tree and where's the carbon, you know? Yeah. So all of this, again, lends itself to, to more security by being by being firmly uh, ingrained on a blockchain, right? Yeah. Given that we anyway are proof of stake blockchain, so we don't have the en energy problem and the little energy you do use in, in nearly any context we are set, we also take pride in being a net zero blockchain, which is uh, which is an important part of the profile and, and what we want to be. So it's only natural that we would attract uh, quite a number of people building solutions around that that nature. So. So Arivo and, and several others are doing that. And then we, we do a variety of other use cases we, in the automotive industry, in the obviously NFT industry, et cetera, right? But because we're relatively young uh, blockchain, uh, our MVP didn't come out so long ago. Yeah. Much of this is, is being built on the test net uh, and, and for later launch. But, but key areas that we see at the moment is actually uh, carbon carbon related uh, seems to be something many people are thinking about uh, uh, ticketing which is pretty obvious for nft tickets for concerts sports games yeah. uh, other provenance things you want to prove that this cup of coffee that you pay 
three times the price for because they treat the farmers well. Mm -hmm. You actually want to know that they treat the farmers well. So yeah. that type of provenance cases, data security cases, which is very obvious, people that need to prove that an algorithm was working at this point in time, a little while back in time, if they get an inquiry. Again, very obvious to put a slice of that algorithm down on a blockchain on a continuous basis. So many of these aspects, uh, and, and then of course there are also NFT market uh, plays, uh, gamification, etc. It is, as I said, uh, a layer one blockchain, meaning that we're pretty agnostic vis-a-vis -vis what you want to build. I mean, think Ethereum, just uh, just with with the possibility of, of an identifying who you're dealing with and a lot more scalability and a lot of other stuff, but that's natural because Ethereum was built in 15, we're now 2022. So of course we've we learned some stuff and, and, and can improve on that. But essentially that's what it is. Whatever you're building is very, and, and if it could particularly benefit from an ID component, Concordium is a good choice for you. So, so it's not like we restrict ourselves to this or that type of, uh, of use case. Okay, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. <coughs> very, very well said. You couldn't have said it better. So uh, we have one more thing to talk about, but we will do that right after this short break. Stay with us. If you're looking for a game, a decentralized exchange, and a market of rare utility driven NFTs all in one, then what you need is DeFi Kingdoms. Now, DeFi Kingdom combines gamified elements to enhance user experience. Now, with the integration of NFTs and gamified elements, make it an instant hit for users. But due to a little network RPC issue on the Harmony Blue. On a scale of 1 to 10, what relationship do you think the metaverse has with NFTs? The metaverse is a virtual reality where users walk, meet, game, and socialize together. One of the technologies making the metaverse possible is the blockchain technology. So to transact on this virtual world, a user would need cryptocurrency or non-fungible tokens, NFTs. A lot of play to earn games we have today have their metaverse with native cryptocurrencies that are used for Hello, my name is Chiki and I'm the boy of the bullet. Keep watching Crypto TV Plus. Don't touch that die. Peace. Thank you for staying with us. This is still Inside Blockchain, live from Crypto TV Plus. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be looking at a very uh, important personality who has done remarkably well in the fintech and technology space is no other person but Lars Sears Christensen. He is the chairman of the Concordia blockchain. Once again, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So um, I think right now we need to actually understand uh, who would you say are the trusted uh, third party identity issuer on Concordia and do you think like, is there any provision for any third party uh, ID issuer to come on board on the infrastructure? Yeah, we would like to have uh, really as many credible identity issuers as possible because uh, we, we don't want to do the identification, right? We don't want to have a situation where people could say, oh, you choose and pick. This is exactly like any other permissionless blockchain, except you have to go through uh, ID, uh, ID provider of your, of your choosing. So currently there's like three or four uh, different, so you can choose them in the process and say, I prefer this one to that one. That could be people like uh, Nota Bene or Digital Solutions. They have, some of them have, have varied aspects of, of, of what they can do inside identification, but, the, but what's common for them all is that they're generally accepted ID issuers that probably are among the people that, uh, that a government would, would use, right? So, yeah. uh, but, but it's your choice. We really don't want to interfere in that process. Uh, we just want to deliver a great blockchain that can do a lot more than just having this identification feature. But, uh, but at the end of the day, if, if anybody else has a, a credible, uh, uh, proven new, uh, identity issue or business, we'll be happy to talk to them because we can have more than, than the three or four that we have currently. Okay, that's fantastic. So taking a closer look at uh, the Concordia blockchain now, uh, let's talk a bit about the privacy revoker function. Now, why the privacy revoker function is available to regulators who can essentially override privacy protocols? Why is that available it's, to them? It's, it's, it's based a little bit on, on my experiences from the traditional uh, banking system, right? Now, in, in, 
in Saxo Bank, for example, if, if a regulator has a mandate under law that, for example, if they have suspicion that somebody has been doing something wrong in their trading account, if they have a lawful mandate to come and say, we, we need to hear more about this account, then we're trying to mirror that, right? Uh, and that doesn't mean that anybody, your friends can go and ask about or this or that. Or if you had a court order in the jurisdiction that it relates to, uh, then, then that would also be the case. This is handled by law firms that make these decisions. Again, we are not sitting there making those decisions, but, but the fact that we do know from, from the ID process that we can, we can identify the jurisdiction also means that uh, one day when regulators are are fully there and know exactly what they want. I mean, we, we can run one set of rules for Switzerland, one set of rules for the UK, one set of rules for Denmark, one set of rules for, for wherever, because we have that fundamental building block, right? And, and it's important to understand that that is what we deliver, the fundamental building block of KYC procedures, etc. Now, KYC is something different. If, if you want to be a member of the local uh, you know, golf club or something like that, or you want to trade sophisticated derivatives with Saxo Bank. Mm -hmm. There's probably this KYC procedure at both places, but the one at Saxo Bank would be much heavier around your experience, etc. Yeah. if you want to trade yeah. trade a sophisticated derivative. And that's for the use case to decide. But what, what, what we guarantee is that the ID that that person comes to you with as a foundation of that KYC, that is a true ID and, and, and what the person is telling you based on that ID is the truth, right? Yeah. So, so the revocation is, is really only subject to legal procedures or uh, mandated by law, which regulator can do some things and, and not other things, right? Uh, so, so that's the one part of it. The other part, which actually is more important because if you wanted to do something really bad, would, would you really choose Concordium for it when there's 9,999 other blockchains where you don't have that requirement. Yeah. So I hope it's kind of self-regulatory in many ways. So the real day-to-day -day use case is this that we discussed earlier, that if you and I want to do some business, I would also like to know who you are and you would like to know who I am. And if I choose or you choose to give me that information upon my request, I know that it's true. You know, I, I wouldn't know that if we were messaging on Facebook or yeah. on, on WhatsApp or whatever. I could tell you anything, right? I could be Napoleon, right? Uh, but, uh, but here, because you've gone through that process and because of sophisticated cryptography, you know that if I'm telling you that I'm Lars uh, and I'm Danish, you know that it's true. If I tell you I'm 25 years old, you know immediately it's not true yes. because it'll be flagged, unfortunately. But uh, okay. so, uh, so, so, so that's a real day-to-day -day benefit, I think that, and sometimes, actually in many, many serious use cases, you would want to know that information. You would also want to know that maybe you don't live in this country or that you're above this age or something. And it's also, it's a sophistication of just showing a, an ID paper because if I just need to know that you don't live in North Korea, for example, right? Yeah. Uh, well, you can show me two cryptography. No, I don't live in North Korea, but you don't have to tell me that you live in France, right? If I have to tell you, yes, I'm over 18, I don't have to tell you that the I'm, 50, age, I'm yeah. 59 or, or, or show you my, my social but security number yeah. or this and that. So it's, it's exactly the aspects of your identity that you need and you're willing to give out for these use cases. So it's much more sophisticated than if you go down to the kiosk and, and, and you know, you send one of your daughters down for a bottle of wine or something and she has yeah. to show uh, probably her home address, the social security number, her age, her full name, blah, blah, blah. That guy only needs to know she's over 18, right? So, so why should he get more information than that? Okay, well, that's interesting. That's very, very interesting. So I think we have a couple of more things to talk about. Now, the Concordium blockchain also uses intershards to support cross-communication among smart contracts and also private shards and also a third, a third layer system, which is execution consensus network layer. Um, can you help us make sense of what this is? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we have some of the world's, really some of the world's best cryptographers involved in this project. In fact, people that invented uh, part of the building, fundamental building blocks of blockchain. Yeah. You know, the hash code that, that ties yeah. together the Sha blocks, yeah, uh, the, the little code that, ha that puts together the blocks. Well, that was invented by Professor Damgaard in 1979 uh, in, uh, in a Danish university, and he's yeah. our, our lead science advisor. So we have some real iconic guys. And then, of course, we, we, we have a whole group of, 
of, of younger innovative cryptographers uh, in this. So there's a lot of cryptographer in here, in here. Now, some of the key problems that we need to solve, and I would not even say that we have yet solved it, we expect to solve it, but for example, Sharding is very important now. Okay. Sharding itself is not difficult. You have a blockchain, you begin to see it, it nears critical uh, capacity, you do a copy of it. That, that's a shard, right? Yeah. That's not difficult. What's difficult is to get these two shards to talk to together. Talk to each other, yeah. and, and that is actually an unsolved problem, you know, and there's a lot of work going on uh, in cryptographic circles to solve this in a, in, a, in a full way, right? Because that would mean that if you have multiple shards that can Talking intercommunicate, yeah. then you have a true blockchain, right? If you put your, your, your mass transactions on a side blockchain, that's with a very serious uh, security compromise because what happens there is that for those transactions you run on much fewer nodes and then sometimes you put the, the state back to, uh, to, for example, Ethereum, which on the other hand is very safe because there's a lot of nodes, right? But because there's a lot of nodes, they can't execute very many transactions, right? Which we all know with gas prices, et cetera. Yeah. So you put it onto a side chain and the sidechain can do a lot of transactions, but that's because you have a serious compromise with security. So the nirvana, if you will, of blockchain is to do all of the transactions on a real blockchain with many nodes, and that requires sharding, and that requires intercommunication between the shards. Now that is a problem that we're working on and that we fully believe that we will solve, uh, but that before we, uh, that is solved by anyone. Uh, we don't have a true scalable blockchain, right? I mean, we can already scale on, on one shot. We can do far more transactions than, for example, in Ethereum. But if you want to do millions of transactions every second, 100% secured, not 99.99% secured, you need to do them on a profitable blockchain, and that requires shards that can communicate, right? Yeah. The second thing that, that we have on top, or the third thing, if you will, we have a consensus mechanism, proof of stake, not so different from from what else is out there. Now and the, the Solana blockchain. Yeah, yeah. Solana, Cardano, yeah. most modern blockchains, because yeah. people have identified the, well, actually Solana is this proof of history, right? But, but yeah. proof of stake is probably the, the, the more chosen one, right? Uh, and the problem with any consensus mechanism is that if you can gain control of 51% or 67% or whatever, you can actually do rollbacks, you know. Yeah. People underestimate this risk. You could, in theory, uh, roll uh, Bitcoin back to the Genesis block, right? You could yeah. do that uh, or create a new Genesis block that, that now looked like it was the real one, right? That's because there's no finality. There, there, there's uh, there's probabilistic finality, probably it's okay. Yeah. It's not deterministic that it is determinist. And, and you can only do that by building a second layer of, of deterministic finality, which means that every, almost as, as frequently as you print the block, you decide this is the new Genesis block. Anything that comes before that cannot be changed, right? Yeah. And this is an underestimated problem with blockchains today that in extreme scenarios, you can roll back most of them quite a long way, even to the beginning. If you don't have the finality layer, you you, you don't have 100% security. And the finality layer is like a, a third component in, in this blockchain consensus finality layer, uh, and actually also has a reward system like the consensus, so people want to participate in that as well. But what it in essence means that right now we start from here, build from here, anything before that cannot be changed, even if somebody, Genesis, okay. even if somebody gained control of of, of a 50%. Ma ma majority of the network, this is not widely understood. That actually, nearly any other, any blockchain that doesn't have that does carry some degree of risk, particularly particularly proof of work, because it's not that difficult to imagine that you could you could have very large uh, computing power at least for a short while. You can just rent it in the sky, right? Yeah. Uh, rent it in the cloud, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so it's not as secure as people make it out to be. But with finality, it is. And realistically, a serious blockchains that have finality, I can't. Algorand, us. Yeah, not, I, th not, I, th not, I think. Some, I think something. Speaking of the fifty percent, I think that's how uh, you cannot uh, actually relate it to what happened with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. You know, when there was a fifty percent uh, control of the hashing power. So I think on a lighter note, um, mm. do you think there will be any incentive to the blockchain community? Would you be willing to grant uh, the Nigerian community a bit of interviews once in two to three months, uh, specifically Crypto TV Plus on the progress with Concordium? 
yes, is that something of, of you're course, to I'd do? be I'd be delighted to, and uh, I, I do come here every now and again. But otherwise, we can we can do it via via Zoom. I actually have uh, a nice studio like this. Uh, I have a studio business in in Denmark as well. Oh yeah, so, yeah. I so, saw uh, so you like, we, have yeah. a YouTube channel for that. Yeah, yeah. Speak yeah, speak, uh, speak a B Studios, which uh, can intercommunicate fine here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in short, I'd be delighted to. Thank you for asking. That's fantastic. So before we let you go, finally. Um, now, uh, it, it, the information that was made available said you are here to invest, to explore, and proffer solutions to the Nigerian tech landscape. Now, how do you plan to go about that? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm meeting a few people. I'm seeing uh, some, uh, some innovation hubs, etc. Uh, and then I'm just trying to expand my, my direct view of this. You know, I, I, I do come to Nigeria every now and again because my my wife is half Nigerian, so wow, so it's not like I'm it's not like I'm here for the first time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so so I have some insight, but 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 uh, but it's 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 very nice to spend some dedicated time uh, on on understanding it better. And yes, I think there's there's tremendous opportunities for Africa as a whole, and Nigeria is kind of one of the, if not the most important tech center in in, in Africa. And when it comes uh, to blockchain and cryptocurrency, well, I, I think blockchain can, can solve a lot of interesting problems uh, that that uh, that one might have with ID, registration of ownership. You know, also more more transparency, perhaps also in the public sector, etc. There's a lot of stuff that that blockchain can be used for. But there's also, in general, of course, you know, you probably think, oh, this is a problem with with a lot of unemployment and many young people, and it is a problem for sure. But at the same time, the problem we have in, 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 in Western Europe, for example, is that we don't have enough young people, right? We don't have, we, we, we don't have this immediate and, and secure growth of yeah. activity that you have when you have a lot of young people. And of course, these young people will need services and they will be very different from an older generation. So I think smart tech people here, smart blockchain solutions will, will have a tremendous future. So if I'm lucky to fall over something interesting or somebody that has a fund that invests in that type of thing, which is probably my preference because yeah. sitting looking at hundreds of oh, ideas is, is, is yeah, not very scalable. I totally but, uh, but I think it's interesting and I think there's a great future. And obviously, for many reasons, there's quite high adoption in, in Nigeria as well, based on real needs, you know, yeah. for transmission and and purchasing things and inclusion, whereas in, 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 in Europe, you know, it's probably largely speculation or, or affinity to a project. But yeah. here, blockchain can solve real problems, right? The existing yeah. problems. And I, I like that, that, that there's a real true Use problems case to be, to mm. be solved. And, and so I, 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 I'm sure that Nigeria, in, in specifically, and, and Africa at large will, 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 will prosper a lot from from developing these solutions oh that's fantastic uh, thank you so much lars for coming in thank, thank you. you so much it's been an absolute pleasure it's been a wonderful experience uh, having this conversation with you um to enjoy the rest of your day thank you very much and that's all for today visit our website cryptotvplus.com to get more updates and trends captured within the world of blockchain and cryptocurrency Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at Crypto TV Plus and on Instagram at Official Crypto TV Plus to get daily info on our programs. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and ping the bell icon to stay updated for the next episode of the Inside Blockchain. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm Bobby Andy See you next week.